previously on Atop the Fourth Wall. So let's dig into ROM Space Knight number 1 through 40 and behold the saga of the greatest of the Space Knights. <gasps> Eduardo got deported? <gasps> Eduardo got sold to a law firm? That's right, Linkara. I now possess all of Poyo's data. And unless you follow my instructions to the letter, well, I'd say that it would be a shame if something were to happen to this little chip, but I'd be lying. <gasps> Eduardo got fired from the law firm! The bloodshed! The lives lost! The heartache! The sleepless nights never knowing! <laughs> A chicken? <gasps> Eduardo got amnesia? <gasps> Eduardo doesn't think he's a chicken anymore? ¿Te gusta el helado de chocolate? Mi profe favorito es el señor Cifuente. If I go around the country tricking doctors into thinking I'm a real surgeon and then telling YouTube personalities they need a procedure, I could get every music reviewer on YouTube a lobotomy, so I'm the only smart one left on the entire internet! <laughs> the only thing that you ever cared about was my wallet and my bank account! <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I could still pick up my Nintendo 64, right? I left it at your mother's house. What? No! <gasps> Eduardo's a figment of my deranged imagination! <gasps> There's no one on the other end of this phone! Damn it to hell, after 15 inconclusive medical tests and a bunch of unhelpful Spider-Man comics, we still have no idea which one of us is the clone. We must consult the Oracle. Only he is wise enough to help us unravel this mystery. Oh, great and powerful Oracle, we are in desperate need of your help. Yes? <sighs> Why does this keep happening to me? <gasps> Who's that? And now, the conclusion. This is Rom, the Space Knight. You can imagine he comes from another galaxy with his flashing neutralizer. Activate Rom. You can imagine. Last time on Rom Space Knight! I spent 40 minutes already detailing the stuff already. Just watch that video. When you're done, come back here so we can dig into Rom Space Knight number 41 through 75. Before we continue on with the cliffhanger of last time, let's first take a brief look at one of the ROM annuals. There are a few places, continuity-wise, where this could take place, but it is at times kind of difficult to be certain because of the serial nature of the issues. Basically what happens is that ROM, on the trail of a large area of dire wraith activity, comes across a group of children who have had a great deal of their life force absorbed by a being calling himself Stardust. The prologue seems to imply that he comes from some kind of sentient galaxy 
galaxy or star calling itself the body. It's banished to the depths of space and naturally arrives on Earth. Seriously, does this happen on other planets too? Do we have a big sign on the other side of the moon saying that we have vacancies and low rates? Stardust starts attacking dire wraiths and absorbing them into its form, in the process actually defeating the dire wraiths' plan of jamming devices that would make them immune to detection from Rom's energy analyzer. Rom politely asks for the energy of the kids back, since he doesn't really give a crap if Stardust is killing dire wraiths, but Stardust refuses. There's also a backup story set 200 years ago, where Rom is betrayed by another space knight in a complicated gambit to learn the dire wraiths' secrets that ended with his death. That knight's name was Gloriole. Glory Ole. I know you expect me to make some kind of joke out of that, but my brain is broken trying to think of something. I'm pretty sure it was completely accidental, too. Nobody caught this. Or they just had a horribly dirty sense of humor about this comic for some reason. But anyway, let's get back to the main series for a bit. When we last left off, Brandy and Starshine had merged into a single being, but had been mind-controlled by Dire Wraith Dr. Dread. I love alliteration. Rom had prevented a powerful Dire Wraith creature called the Dweller on the Threshold from crossing over to Earth, but was trapped on the other side of a portal with it. So how is Rom going to get out of this one? Well, with the help of none other than Doctor Strange. The good Doctor quickly learns of the Wraith threat and how they were hidden even from his knowledge. Tis a battle fought for the salvation of Earth, waged by a man of another world against an unholy harbinger of horror. I, Stephen Strange, am also fond of alliteration. It is not the way of Doctor Strange to remain neutral during such a clash. I am going to impose so many sanctions! Doctor Strange travels to the other dimension to aid Rom in his fight with the Dweller on the Threshold, while back on Earth, Brandy as Starshine wrecks Clareton up quite a bit. Even the torpedo is smacked aside by Starshine when he tries to intervene. Starshine and Doctor Dread teleport away so they can kill Rom upon his return. Speaking of, Rom and Doctor Strange compare notes and use a spell to detect the largest concentration of Wraith activity in the Soviet Union. Strange teleports Rom there, but unfortunately he can't work on the Wraith threat right now due to other threats that call out to him. Okay, like half the Marvel Universe's heroes know about the Wraiths now. Is anybody else actually gonna do something about this? Unfortunately, one thing has been made clear from the last several issues, including the one right before this. Rom is miserable and desperate for his humanity again. The Dweller in the Threshold even almost succeeded in tempting Rom with a vision of his humanity. He finds a machine in the heart of the Wraith activity that promises to clone him a new body if he gives up his armor to the machine, and Rom accepts. The computer, Quasimodo, actually has a pretty long backstory spanning multiple different series, but I'll spare you the details. Basically, he's allied with the Dire Wraiths, and he indeed honors the bargain with Rom, giving him a human body again while he possesses Rom's armor. However, while Quasimodo is more than happy to say, screw Rom, he also realizes that the Dire Wraiths might at some point declare him a threat, so he uses the Neutralizer to banish them. Rom goes through a ton of emotions about the whole thing, happy at having restored his humanity, then wondering if he made the right decision, but ultimately feels that he's done enough. Plus, with so many of Earth's heroes now aware of the threat, Earth is in good hands. Yeah, and they've done such a bang-up job of fighting the Wraiths so far. Rom soon discovers the cloning technique is imperfect and degeneration will start settling in soon. And after Rom discovers that his original body is still active, he decides to become the Scarlet Space Knight. Quasimodo, however, soon discovers he has nothing to celebrate, since Starshine and Dr. Dread arrive and attack, thinking he's Rom. Before Starshine can actually kill him, Quasimodo finally abandons the body. In his rage over what he's done to Brandy, Rom murders Dr. Dread and collapses in Starshine's arms. Starshine, now freed of the control, naturally has no friggin' clue how to put Rom back into his old body, but they're aided by a Soviet scientist named the Gremlin. The Gremlin, as it happens, is the son of the Gargoyle, the guy who fought the Hulk in his first appearance. Long story short, he learned that the Soviets are responsible for his father's death and wants the aid of the Space Knights in gaining his revenge. As it happens, my Clone Saga joke may be more apt than I originally thought, since indeed the clone is dying with a separate mind from the restored Rom. 
two ROMs? The original and the clone. Both exist now, for a time. No doubt Judas Travel Wraith will be along soon to make really stupid experiments about this whole thing. Destroy the humans within the exoskeletal armor, Gremlin? Take from them their humanity as mine was stolen from me? No, that I can never do. Human life is too precious. I suppose you could argue Rom never actually killed anyone since it was the clone who murdered Dr. Dredd, but as I said last time, he did deliberately kill some dire wraiths already, so this attempt at maintaining Rom's morality doesn't ring true for me. Anyway, the clone dies and tells the two to embrace their love, since being alive, that is the greatest gift of all. But you are alive! I am a cyborg. You are a... Man! You are a man! <laughs> the hell? After telling the gremlin of the dire ray threat, he suspects that they've infiltrated several levels of the Soviet government. And indeed, the wraiths recruit a team of Soviet superheroes to fight them. Including one that's basically just a half-man, half-bear. And dirty commie or not, you just have to respect that. After a brief battle, the Soviet superheroes soon realize that the Wraiths are their true enemy. The plan of the Russian Wraiths is to resurrect long-dead, extinct animals and unleash them on our heroes. Yes, zombie dinosaurs and mammoths and other creatures. Dear Lord, do I love comic books. After defeating them, our heroes fly off, but unfortunately Rom has to be a major buzzkill. He's convinced that the love he and Starshine feel for each other is unnatural while they remain in cyborg bodies, and that while Brandy could be separated from Starshine, he can still never be human ever again. Dude, this woman dug up the corpse of your ex-girlfriend and merged with her body so she could have robot sex with you. If that screams unnatural love to you, well, mister, you've got a lot to learn. As I mentioned last time, there's a bit of a schism in the dire wraiths. It seems there are gender and philosophical disparities. Dire wraith women are usually the sorcerers and magic users, while the dire wraith men proposed science, and it was them who suggested the warships that first got them to try to invade Galador. Male dire wraiths are the ones that look like Harry Scary, while the females look like if nightmares were painted pink or like chewed bubblegum. After 200 years, the Wraith Witches have had enough, decreeing that this action is what caused them to be dispersed from their homeworld and their continuing failure to conquer Earth. As such, they slaughter the male dire Wraiths and declare that from now on, magic shall define the ways of Wraith kind on Earth. Why? Because it's magic. We don't have to explain it. Let's take a break from the main action and check in with ROM Annual Number 2, which tells in more detail how ROM went to Wraith World after the war to continue hunting them and force them to flee their world. While they escaped, they trapped ROM on the planet with a spell that made him see dire wraiths everywhere, forcing him to fight everything around him. But really, how could anyone be fooled by such a simple deci- Oh my god, my chair is a dire wraith! <laughs> Fortunately, a group of other space knights sent from Galador retrieve him and break the spell. In the wake of these events, it's now here where Rom declares they have to hunt down the wraiths throughout the universe, even though he was supposed to have done that on Galador in a previous flashback. Then again, Rom was traveling through space for 200 years. This is why it's important to keep a diary on these things, or else you forget the fine details. Back in the main book, Rom continues to be mopey over the next few issues, craving his humanity more and more. He even wonders if he should become as ruthless as the Diorates if he ever hopes to win the war, or even if he wants to win the war at all when there's nothing left for him now after it. Starshine tries to convince him that their humanity, their very souls, are worth keeping up the fight, even to the point of taking things on faith. But, unfortunately, her humanity betrays her upon their return to Clareton. In their absence, the new all-sorceress dire wraiths have upped their game. Instead of merely copying the residents of the town, they pretty much become them, killing the originals. That includes Brandy's parents and Steve. They hide themselves from Torpedo's wraith detector and set a trap for Rom and Starshine. Their magics aren't powerful enough to kill the Space Knights, but they are able to hurl the two through several alternate dimensions so they can't return. Because, you know, piercing through alternate dimensions? <laughs> Child's play. Beaming a bomb inside Rom's head? What do you think they are, magicians? Oh, wait. 
The massacre of the town continues into issue 50, sadly, where Torpedo is killed by the Wraiths. It's a damn shame. It's like they're clearing the deck of all the side characters for no good reason. It's senseless, which I suppose is the point, to drive home the need for humanity and goodness in the face of all these terrible things. However, narratively, it's unsatisfying. There are things that you need to do in stories to reflect reality, but other things you most certainly don't have to do. It's still a fictional story, which means characters shouldn't just die pointlessly. You don't need to kill them for dramatic effect. In the previous 50 issues, the threat has been enough. It comes across more like you don't know what to do with them, so instead of finding proper closure for the characters, you just take them out of the toy box, snap them in half, and toss them in the garbage. But let's get back to the story, shall we? Rom and Starshine, stuck in the other dimension, are soon set upon by the shadowy inhabitants of it. Starshine has lost her will to fight now that everyone she loves is dead. This is a space between spaces. It's the kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Rom manages to convince Starshine to fight by reminding her of the same words she spoke to him, plus of how many more people will die if the Wraiths aren't defeated. Starshine swears off her life as Brandy, declaring her dead, and fully embraces herself as Starshine, her space knight body molding itself into a new form. In rage and in revenge, let Starshine be reborn! In rage and in revenge, let my new head fin rise! Rom quickly realizes the mistake he's made, since Starshine has basically gone a bit kill-crazy. In the meantime, though, an unexpected force arrives on Earth in the 50th issue to save the day. The Skrulls. I only glanced over them last time, so let me explain the Skrulls a bit for non-comic readers. They're an alien race frequently seen in the Marvel Universe, primarily because they have the same trick as the Dire Wraiths. They're shapeshifters. They've tried to invade Earth and secretly conquer it multiple times now. You see what I mean when I said last time that aliens are pulling this kind of crap all the time in comics? I'm surprised any regular humans are still around at this point. And of course, all times they've failed, though Marvel has used them before to bring back dead heroes, like saying the ones who died were Skrulls in disguise or something. The most recent example of this was a crossover event from a few years ago called Secret Invasion. However, the last Angry Geek, who you should also be watching, in his review of the event's main comic more aptly named it Damn Obvious Assault. He is correct. However, that's a tale for another day. In the meantime, Starshine strikes at Rom when he tries to stop her from killing the race, and he in turn threatens her to do no harm. She just calmly walks away in her rage. Rom realizes that Brandy Clark's humanity is gone forever, which really sucks because she still owes him some money. The Skrulls explain that the Diorates are actually an offshoot race from theirs, one that embraced dark magic and eventually led to war with the Skrulls. The Skrulls were victorious, but the Wraiths escaped into the Dark Nebula to continue their plotting. Since their exile from the Nebula by Rom and the Space Knights, they've also begun infiltrating the Skrull Empire, so now they're just as hell-bent on fighting the Wraiths as anyone else. These Skrulls are called away to deal with stuff happening in another book, telling Rom to keep up his own job on Earth. And what a job it's done, with half the town in flames and half the population dead. However, some good does come from this tragedy. In the mass funeral for all those killed in the last few issues, reporters descend on the town to figure out what's going on here. As such, Rom and Starshine share their story of the Wraith threat to the entire world, showing holograms of what's come before. It's another jumping on issue to get any new readers up to speed. What? No, 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 you can't have new readers jumping on to a long-running series. You need to start up a new book from issue one, give it a holofoil cover, have Wolverine and Deadpool guest star, and give away a Mr. T trading card. Heretofore, I have attempted to seek out Wraithkind in secrecy, fearful of alarming humanity at large. Now you can all rest easy knowing that your friends and loved ones might in fact be horrifying demon wizards from beyond the stars that want to eat your soul. Glad to be of help. Unfortunately, in the wake of all this death and misery that has occurred recently, it seems Rom has had a change of heart and now intends to kill Wraiths instead of banishing them. The tide has turned! The moment to be merciful has passed! Whereas before, I banished Wraithkind off Earth to the Shadow Realm called Limbo- Wait, Shadow Realm?! The Dire Wraiths play Yu-Gi-Oh?!
Also, I don't get it. It's frequently said throughout the series that death is preferable for the Dire Wraiths to being banished, since the Limbo Dimension doesn't have anything for them to do. Now that you know the enemy is among you, will you yield your world to them? Or will the Earth rise up and fight? Mail your answers to Rom Space Knight, P.O. Box 495, Clareton, USA. The Dire Wraiths, of course, now realize that things have turned against them, and in Issue 52, they answer Rom's call for war by going out into the open in total war with him and humanity. The army works with Rom as the Wraiths attack and devastate a small town on the eastern seaboard. In the wake of so many lives lost or destroyed, even Starshine's newfound anger seems a bit tempered. Aw, don't feel bad, guys. Why don't you go see Return of the Jedi, like that poster suggests? Or, uh, you guys can watch a pile of bodies be set ablaze to avoid pestilence and disease on the battlefield. That'll cheer you right up, I guess. So, uh, anyone want to call the Avengers or the Fantastic Four to see if they're up to helping us out? Maybe Brute Force? No? Okay. The government sets up Project Wraith Watch, working alongside Rom to pinpoint all Wraith activity on Earth and finally do something about it. The Wraiths counterattack by launching a full-scale assault on the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier, which of course is defended by the badassness of Nick Fury. But also lots of guys in yellow jumpsuits. It's actually a brilliant tactic by S.H.I.E.L.D. Not even the Dire Wraiths will shapeshift into something that awful looking. The Wraiths try to fight S.H.I.E.L.D. using spells on the deck of the Helicarrier, but this Helicarrier has a trick that the Marvel Cinematic Universe version doesn't. It can go up into space. And my comparison of these Wraiths to chewed bubblegum takes on a frightening new reality, as you can see. After this attack, Nick Fury joins Rom and Starshine to meet President Reagan to discuss the situation. Gotta love the sliding timescale of superhero comic books, especially when heroes meet multiple presidents in what is supposed to be a time span of less than four years. The question remains, now that we accept there are indeed alien invaders infiltrating our Earth, what are we gonna do about it? Well, I think we should make a public statement calling for the Dire Wraiths to tear down this dark nebula. Nuke the spice scum! Why are you at this meeting? Shockingly, the nuke normal citizens to get at the Dire Wraiths disguised as them plan is rejected, and the president prepares an address to Congress on their next move. From there, Rom and Starshine head to the Pentagon to coordinate efforts. We learn the Dire Wraiths are striking pretty much everywhere on Earth, spreading plague in some areas and attacking ships at sea with mutated sea monsters. It's pulling in everything we've seen the Wraiths do up until now. Rom is also hesitant to share details on mass-producing the energy analyzer, since he fears the plans falling into enemy hands and thus developing countermeasures to them. It's not an invalid concern, considering we keep seeing Wraiths able to infiltrate the highest rank of government. Plus, Rom points out that even with other analyzers, Torpedo was fooled by the Dire Wraiths, altering his perception of the data in front of him, so there's no guarantee it'd actually help. The President makes his speech to Congress and the military, confirming that the threat is real and even has some visual records. He says this is not being broadcast to the world for fear of alarming the public and making them even more paranoid after Rom's broadcast. Because secrecy about an ongoing threat that people have already been made aware of can only result in good. The President's speech is interspersed with dramatizations based on visualizations woven from the living light wielded by the Space Knight Starshine, depicting Dio Race in the act of assuming human form. Ah, nothing like practical special effects, am I right? There should be primetime TV coverage of an alien piercing its tongue into a dude's eye and said dude crumbling to dust. The kids would love this! Fortunately, the president has great news. He's just signed a mutual defense pact with almost every nation on Earth to join together and combat the Dire Wraiths. There will be peace when the people of the world want it so badly that their governments will have no choice but to give it to them. So, Superman 4 was right? What's really sad is that it turns out the Dire Wraiths were just the invention of Ozymandias. 
But yeah, that's great. The nations of Earth united against the threat. Superheroes across the world are brought together. So now America can call on the Fantastic Four and the X-Men and the... A recent attempt to contact a number of America's own superheroes has failed. The Fantastic Four, Avengers, and others seem to have simply vanished. What? Oh, come on! What could they possibly have been doing that would have taken them away from this moment? Oh, hey, how'd this get in my hands? Yeah, it's actually kind of brilliant in that regard by having this revelation occur while so many big names are involved in the event comic Secret Wars. I mean, let's face it, these guys are heavy hitters, and if actively involved in the war, it'd be over fairly quickly. And considering they're trying to keep this information out of the hands of the public, it makes a neat parallel to the event. Rom 2 is engaged in a full-scale secret war. Following this announcement, attempts are made to find new ways of detecting the wraiths without Rom's energy analyzer. The first idea is to use S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, who also happen to be psychic, because superhero comics, but unfortunately the wraiths catch on quickly and use their own magic to counterattack and burn out any Esper who comes close enough to detect them. Fortunately, they decide to bring in some magical assistance of their own to protect the S.H.I.E.L.D. psychics and their goofy helmets. Doctor Strange! Unfortunately, the dude's busy most of the time, so all he can do is cast a spell to protect their agents, and then leave again to go collect his check for the cameo. But anyway, with all these heroes out of the picture, who can team up with Rom next? Well, how about professional sidekick Rick Jones, who you may recall from back in the Hulk's origin? Even he admits in the story that he has the tendency to become the sidekick to the Hulk, Captain America, Captain Marvel, and others. His blood has been tainted by gamma radiation, and doctors inform him that he has a good chance of postponing cancer if they periodically replace his blood. Unfortunately, this comes right in the middle of a diorate plan to infect blood banks and blood stores of humans with materials that cause a monster to burst from their chests. And I don't mean like a traditional xenomorph chest buster. These things are pretty much fully grown from the get-go. I can't imagine how uncomfortable these people must have been right before these things clawed their way out. Fortunately, Rick has saved this fate by the fact that one of his orderlies gets his chest busted. What, did this guy get a blood injection the night before or something? Before Rick's blood could be tainted. Next issue, Rom and Starshine head out to the town of Beaver Falls. Here we go off to Beaver Falls, Beaver Falls, Beaver Falls. Here we go off to Beaver Falls, so early in the morning. Oh, I love it when comics serve up these reference opportunities on a platter. Good times. <laughs> Well, except for the people with monsters exploding out of them. That sucks. Beaver Falls is in Canada, and unfortunately, the Wraiths managed to flood an entire town despite the efforts of Rom, Starshine, and Canadian superhero team Alpha Flight. The purpose of the flood was to carry tainted water, cursed by a spell, into almost every section of Canadian soil, which I guess you can do with a single lake. I mean, how big can Canada be, really? Ant-Man soon arrives to help as well, although I should note that this is not Hank Pym, but rather another character named Scott Lang. At this point, Hank Pym had become Yellow Jacket, because Hank Pym changes code names and costumes around so much you'd think they were trading cards, and Scott took over. The good news is that everyone is back from Secret Wars, so the Avengers have now been informed of the Diary threat, and they've apparently fought the Wraiths over in their own book. Hell, there's a lot of tie-in stuff going on. Rom even encountered the Hulk in a team-up book. However, we're not going to cover that since we're trying to focus on the main series itself. Anyway, by analyzing Hank Pym's shrinking formula, Rom and Starshine are able to shrink themselves with Scott to investigate what's going on under the Earth. There, they find ants mutated by the tainted water, and Rom quickly realizes what the plan is. The insects and small animals transformed by the water will soon be eaten by larger animals, tainting them, which will in turn taint humans who hunt them. It's not exactly instant world domination, but it's pretty clever. And this, my friends, is why I prefer my pesticide and chemically processed junk food over your so-called health food. <laughs> Although, the weight loss might be worth turning into a horrible demon monster. Ant-Man is sent back out to warn the people, but he emerges from underground to find people already under attack by tainted insect swarms. Rom and Starshine, meanwhile, shrink themselves even further, hoping to stop the taint spell directly at the molecular source. Uh, Rom, I, 
I, I don't think you can banish quite enough molecules to make a difference. Ant-Man summons an army of flying ants to combat the Tainted Ones. My friends, you heard me! You came! We'll be fighting your relatives, fellas, but something's been done to them. Something evil! And unless we stop them, they'll swarm over the entire Earth until neither ant nor man is left to stand against them! So what's the word? Are you with me? Well, not exactly the St. Crispin's Day speech, was it? The Wraith Taint spreads surprisingly quickly as even people in Canadian cities find themselves besieged by mutated animal life. Fortunately, Rom has a plan once they shrink down small enough to reach the Wraith Taint itself. Destroying it won't do any good, since all it'll do is cure one ant. Instead, Rom decides to treat it like a virus, strengthening the ant's immune system against it. I'm pretty sure from the small amount of research I did that ant immune systems don't quite work like that, but whatever. The ant is able to create antibodies against the wraith taint, which Rom then spreads via the taint's connection to all the other infected animals to kill it off and spread the cure as far as it can. And apparently ants can still indeed talk, according to this comic. You destroyed the evil within us, Space Knight, and made us whole once again. May your queen reproduce in generous quantities, Space Knight. We will ever stand ready to aid mankind in defending our Earth from the Dire Wraiths. We shall disrupt the picnics of any Dire Wraiths we come across. In the next issue, Rick Jones has a prophetic dream, supposedly, of Wraith World, but then soon sees... Statue of Liberty. That was our planet! Starshine, in the wake of Rom being able to solve the Wraith Taint problem without having to exterminate all the infected and even making friends with the ants, realizes that she's becoming the inhuman machine that Rom always feared he was, and that he's displayed more humanity than she has and suddenly realizes how it's kind of crappy not being human anymore. Upon finding a little girl named Cindy, who shares the memories of a dire wraith who was killed while trying to replace her, our heroes soon learn of the greater plan. Why the wraiths have been trying to corrupt humanity so viciously. Why the massive taint upon the land and creatures. They're trying to turn Earth into a new wraith world. The story continues in Rom Annual Number 3, where Hybrid once again reconstitutes himself in human form. He's taken in by a priest, and naturally kills everyone around him until Rom and Starshine arrive to deal with him. However, Hybrid separates Starshine from her armor, both to mock her and for his plans to breed and create more like himself. But with the assistance of Professor Xavier and the New Mutants, Brandy is able to banish Hybrid once again. Well, regardless of the circumstances, she is at least human again, for better or for worse. So anyway, it's time for the end of the world. Rum, the Space Knight, an electronic toy new from Parker Brothers.